Well, my name is, is Laura M. Wright. Dake. Well, Dake's my husband. He's, he's long gone, so just Laura Wright. Now I'm an old lady. But when I was 14, I had me an adventure and a love that lasted a lifetime. Well then, it began in New Orleans in the spring of 1858. I'd come down the Mississippi River with my Uncle John, my first time ever away from the farm in Warsaw. The very next day after we docked, the biggest, most beautiful white steamboat I ever saw pulled right up into the slip next to us. It was the Pennsylvania. And now this is how he wrote about it. Sam, you know, Sam Clemens, Mark Twain, all right? <laughs> I jumped aboard the John J. Rowe, landing on the boiler deck. I met and shook the hands of my friends there. Now, out of their mist and floating upon my enchanted vision come this slip of a girl, Laura M. Wright. I can see her with perfect distinction in the unfaded bloom of her youth with her plaited head, tails dangling from her young head and her white frock puffing in the wind from that ancient Mississippi time. Well, now I'm an old lady and I'm going out on a blind date to celebrate my 80th birthday in a nightclub. My stars, I've never been to a nightclub before. What with all them brazen flapper hussies and, and lounge lizards and, and, and foul-smelling cigars and, and folks getting spifflicated on cheap gin. Damn, I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm trying to recall why he asked me out to a nightclub. Trying to recall why he asked me out, period what his name is, <laughs> my memory, what it used to be. Now, what if I get to that nightclub and I, I do something foolish and old lady like get, like get drunk on too much champagne and die? It could happen. I'm 80. I should have been dead years ago. I could die any minute. Hell, I expect to die any minute. And if I did, what would happen to these? His letters, the letters he wrote me over the years. Today, I want to honor my mother, Norma Farber, who passed away in 1984. She was a poet, a, a concert a soprano. And when she became a grandmother, she started writing children's books and published over 20 of them in her lifetime. My favorite is called, How Does It Feel to Be Old? And in it, she answers that question from a granddaughter. And now that I have eight grandchildren of my own, and I'm actually older than she was when she started writing this, which was when she was 69, um, I can relate. And I'm going to read a little from the beginning and a little from the end. How does it feel to be old? Very nice. I don't have to listen to parents' advice, such as, watch where you step, don't slip on the ice. Now, tie your shoe. No one's telling me what to do. If somebody does, I just don't hear. Do I make myself clear? <laughs> I please myself, make my own choice. Sometimes I miss my mother's voice and my father's way. So tall, so grand, of taking me firmly by the hand. Nobody's telling me. All the same, I'd like to be called by my childhood name. How does it feel to be old? Quite brave, quite bold. I say what I choose, having nothing to lose. By being a demon, taking a chance, no punishment. 
I can afford to be mean, cranky and mean, ranting and raving. I've nothing to get, no kiss, no reward for proper behaving. I come, I go, as though, as though nobody cared if I came or went. I'll scream if I will, and still, and yet, nobody's made me cry in years. I miss the hug coming after the tears. How does it feel to be old? In a rush, so much to be done, so few more years in which to do. To do. It's hard to remember I once had it all, all the time in the world to go up and down and around the world, travel to places great and small, continents near and countries far, China and Chinatown, Arctic tundra, Australian bush, the Amazon and Zanzibar. If I were five or even ten, I could live my life all over again. But I'm not, and I can't, and I'm just going to live out the rest as I must. How does it feel to be old? Quite late. There's somewhere I'm getting to soon. I haven't been told. Not school, not a playground, nor house of a friend, not the moon. Whatever it is, I'll open a gate. I'll be coming at last to an end of a start. I'm not quite clear. I'll end what I've loved to be doing on earth, my life right here, since the day I was slapped on my bottom at birth. I'll finish my now and my here. Remember the stories I told you, my dear? And nothing surprising need come of the fact. Have you noticed I'm shorter almost than you? I'm shrinking, you're stretching. What else is new? Well, sun keeps rising, journeys of planets continue exact. Wind keeps blowing, sky stays wide. Soon you'll be knowing that grandma has died while you are still growing in inches and pride. Thank you. Uh, this is um, this is called Reimagine. It's um, it was it's first of all a wedding song for my son because um, when my three hundred dollar wedding gift got smashed to pieces and then <laughs> in shipment, I had to do something that didn't cost any money. Um, it's also a kind of a tribute to um, uh, John Lennon's famous song Imagine. It's called Reimagine because. Um, I know it seems presumptuous, but, but even, even though his song became like an anthem for 99% of the world, a tiny minority of people that could have actually changed things have actually made things a hundred times worse in the intervening 40 years, so I felt it was time to reimagine. This 
world is always strange We must guard against all choices That undermine the drive to change Embrace the discomfort that unsettles understanding
is falling fast Inevitability But in the morning dew With sunlight glowing in your hair We ask ourselves again Holding on to possibility Possibility memories. <laughs> Boy, um, there was a stone that was dug up in our backyard uh, 40 years ago, and um, I've been thinking about it a long, long time. So this poem is gazing over outlines. <clears throat> Who writes odes to memory here where fir trees still grow? Think about it. Suburban life, it's, it's noisy. Kids argue, play, sometimes they cry. Hours moved sand inside sandboxes. Those wooden frames now all disintegrated. But not my memory of boys. They worked, they dug and excavated, imagined a treasure found buried beneath roots of the tall trees, crystal-faced stone wrought by Earth's pressure in this once glaciated landscape where no lawnmowers existed. Future is seated in this impermanent ruin. Withered ferns along with pets' cemeteries. Stones sprinkle of light. Stills decays slow dance. No rush, just another autumn leaving. I do spend a lot of time looking at the sky, and I wanted to do a little plug um, for an endeavor I've been with for over 10 years, the lunar calendar. It tells you when the moon rises, where it is in the sky, there's artwork to go with it. Many of our future poets that have been here in Hopkinton have some of the poems in here, in here. So I did bring a few copies, and I welcome you to look through it, take a free postcard, and or buy the actual calendar. Besides looking at the moon, I also spend a lot of time with constellations, and some of the constellations stay in the sky and they just rotate around the pole. But many stars rise in the east and travel along and then set in the west, and they disappear for a while. And when it comes back again, it really is comforting for me in the sky. The um, Big Dipper was the first constellation I knew about and how it tips and changes with the season, but Orion was my second. And when Orion the hunter is up in the sky, I always know it's fall. So this is a poem called Signs of Coming Winter, Constellations. Orion the hunter rises in the eastern sky, takes out his bow, pulls back an arrow, and releases it, piercing the night sky. The arrow soars across the whole horizon, finally finding place in the very heart of Bear. Bear is walking, pacing along the tree line, protecting her bear cub above, who holds that place of polar north. Blood drips to the ground with splashes of bright red appearing below on trees. More and more the bright red blood flows as bear gives last breath of life. Scenery below is filled with bear's passing. Drops eventually turn to yellow and then a deep russet red as the blood dries and the bear becomes quite stiff and still. It is the end of the growing season, dead end. The death of the great bear marks the change. 
Her loss of blood to the leaves and trees below mark this passage. It is a celebration of this loss of life, the death of the great bear. And next comes the season of hibernation, going to the underworld, talking to the ancestors, but also knowing that with spring, Orion the hunter leaves, and then comes the resurrection, the rebirth. The new bear cub is ready to leave the dark cave and explore that springtime wonder, starting that cycle all over once again. Ebony and spruce and walnut He introduced me to the corner where it stood My first impression I recall But it's just a box made out of wood Though it was elegant in silence like a falling of a star It's his heart when he sings And his touch upon the strings That give the wings to Phil's guitar A simple strum behind a folk song Upon a box on which three colors play as one A perfect shape, a perfect union One voice from black and white and brown A harmony in form and color Like a painting by Renoir but it's his heart when he sings And his touch upon the strings That give the wings to Phil's guitar Is it the sharpened tools That shape the wood with skill? Is it the love that paid the bill? Is it a promise that can never be fulfilled I know it can I know it will Now I have come to understand How a guitar becomes more than assembled wood As soon as it leaves the craftsman's hand It joins a song in brotherhood It's like a golden rule to live by What we sing is what we are It's your heart when you sing And your touch upon the strings That give the wings to your guitar it's your heart when you sing And your touch upon the strings That give the wings to your guitar I'm walking my dog after dinner. We found ourselves at the park a few blocks from home. Things are quiet, it has been raining, and the dark is descending. Halfway around the walking track, a Muslim family is playing soccer on the field below. Mother is goalie, in long pants under a long skirt, layered over with a long tunic. A burqa hoods her head and face. The eldest daughter has come of age. She sports American blue jeans and a t-shirt. She too wears a burqa, though her face is open and bright. Her young sisters in Western dress run around their bearded father, who is barking instructions to run for the ball, pay attention. 
All of them are moving and laughing and having fun in the dusk, in the park. This makes me happy in that bittersweet way, wishing to find them similarly engaged in the light of day. I'm back at the park with the dog on a bright, sunny afternoon. The family is back, too. They've just driven their firstborn to join her soccer team for a game. Her sisters wait in the back of the car for mother and father, who stand chatting outside the driver's side door. I am compelled to approach them. I tell them how happy I was to see them together playing, enjoying one another. They smile politely and nodding, thank me, attempting in the tongue of my country to tell me that my dog is nice. Thank you. As the season, the turning of the seasons come, I think other gifts emerge in autumn, and that's the subject of my poem today, Autumn Gifts. Autumn's equidistant dance, circling batons of light and dark, initiate great mystery, dark, deep, holy. Beneath humdrum, spirit rises, lighting daring, unimaginable paths. Knowing grows, hope emerges. Leaves blaze in glorious colors and then wither and die. Nature's truths run deep. The dead dance at November's chill. Spirits rise in joy and we shake hands with the unseen. Autumn's gifts of mystery bring surprise, inner strength, Fires of love burn again. We give thanks for this cornucopia of spirit. Reimagine earth and heaven. Easy if you try. Hell is not 